Today, I want to share with you some of our ideas for Disney World. <laughs> On behalf of the cast of the Walt Disney World Resort, we'd like to welcome you to the Magic Kingdom. If you believe and wish hard enough, you too will see the magic of Tinkerbell as she lights this evening's performance of W Radio. Your informant. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your guide to the Disney parks and experiences. I am your host and your friend, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 802. And since 2004, together, we've been sharing Disney magic through the podcast on my weekly live video every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com. Blog, events, newsletter, and more. You can join the community and find everything at www.radio.com. And this week, I'm trying something new as we have fun conversations and controversy in a new segment I'm calling Disney In or Out. We'll talk about the Disney parks, resorts, Disney Cruise Line, movies, and Disney Plus in a segment where I also invite you to share your thoughts on the discussion and the debates. And of course, I want to know what you think of this new segment idea. Please be sure to stay tuned for the Disney trivia question of the week and your chance to win a Disney prize package. Plus, don't forget to sign up for my free weekly email newsletter to stay connected and not miss an update. And when you do, you can grab a free copy of my 102 Things to Do at Least Once in Walt Disney World book. Connect with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello. And if you want to leverage lessons from the Disney parks into your business or turn what you love into what you do, head on over to LouMangiello.com to find out about how I can come to speak to your event, conference, or to your business, workshops, and ways to take your idea to the next level. And if you like what you hear... I hope that you do. Please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. One of the things I love about Disney is that while we can all agree that it is, by definition and by copyright, the most magical place on earth, we may not always agree on everything about it. And if you've ever been on the internet, you know that when it comes to Disney, the opinions are endless and often quite passionate, which gave me an idea. And this week, we're gonna try something new. We're gonna test out, we're gonna test this idea on the fly and kick our conversation up a little bit of a notch and get into some fun possibly even controversial discussion points from the parks to the resorts, from cruise line to the movies and Disney plus, we're going to have some fun exploring topics that I'm sure you have an opinion on as well. And don't worry. I want you to be part of the conversation as I will post some of these questions in the clubhouse. So I'm going to introduce a new segment. I am calling Disney in or out, and I'll explain exactly what that is. And joining me this week, our friends, members of the WWW Nation and communities. Uh, ladies first, I want to welcome back to the show, Lisa Denoto glassner from ThousandCircles.com. Thank you so much for having me. And, Con oh my God, Connor, I forgot your new website. And Connor Brown from... VacationKingdoms.com. That's it. That's the one. It used to be something else. It used to be... It used to be WDW Opinion, which is ironic because we're going to be sharing a lot of opinions right now. I changed the name to Vacation Kingdom to be more holistic, and then I get the invite to talk about opinions. It's funny how the world works, but I'm here nonetheless and happy. So maybe to I wasn't right, maybe I was inspired by you. It just took a little while for it to finally kick in, like like That's caffeine fine. from Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so 
both of you, welcome to a show where you literally have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. Uh, thank yeah. you for the trust or you just had a boring Monday night. You somehow agreed to join me for a show, probably because I promised you that there was zero prep time, but because there's nothing for you to actually prep for. Uh, so why did you say yes? Right. Why were you, why were you, were you intrigued by the idea or what was it? It just sounded like a fun conversation. I, like I said, before we started recording, I feel like this is the kind of show where like an hour after we hang up, I'm going to think of all of the things that I should have said. Um, <laughs> but setting that aside, like I just it's it just sounds like a fun conversation. And I'm excited to see where things go. And I know like opinions tend to differ among us. So it should be interesting. Yeah, I mean, you said you gave us, you know, no need to prep, but that's because you gave us no prep time. <laughs> you said, would you like to join? Great. Here's the link. And five minutes later, here we are. <laughs> Which is not that far from the truth. So I had yeah. this idea really, really late last night um, in a Dorito filled frenzy. I had uh. this idea and then I sort of thought about it today and I'm like, is this a cool idea? Is this a dumb idea? And then I started writing down some of the questions and I said, hey, you know, are you guys interested? Good. Let's record tonight. And so here we are. Um, and in addition to Lisa and Connor, I want to hear from you, our friend who's listening. I'm going, I want to hear your thoughts on these, whether you agree, disagree, or have your own hot takes on some of these topics. I'll post them in the clubhouse. You, like Lisa, as soon as we're done recording, can also call the voicemail with your own opinions at 407-900-9391. So let me explain to you what the concept is and what hopefully the execution of it is going to be. Um, the idea is that I'm going to not ask you a question, but I'm going to make a statement and then you tell me whether you agree you're in or not, you're out and then take 30 to 60 seconds ish to state why argue or defend your position, et cetera. So for example, I might say, the Boathouse is the best restaurant in Walt Disney World. We then go around the virtual table and you say whether you agree and why or why not. And then, you know, Lisa will argue why she thinks Tony's Town Square is really the best restaurant in Walt Disney World. So uh, this could be fun. It could be slightly controversial, hopefully funny. I have prepared a lot of questions um, that you will actually randomly select from in order to keep it interesting. And then we will see where this potential train wreck takes us. Oh, boy. Here we go. Let's go. <laughs> so uh, I believe in ladies first. Um, I narrowed my list down to 60 questions. So, Lisa, <laughs> you can randomly pick a number from one to 60, and that will be the, the statement that I pull out that you will either say that you are in, out, and then explain why. Um, I will take what's behind door number two, please. <laughs> Look at you going. Two. Fascinating. Uh, this is actually somewhat appropriate based on recent conversations and nation calls. So question two or statement two, in or out, the carousel of progress is an untouchable attraction and should never be replaced. So I'm out. <laughs> I'm out, but th there's two parts of the question, right? It should never be replaced, like, period. It, it's it's an institution in the parks. It's a piece of Walt. Like, it, he had a hand in it. It came straight from the World's Fair. It's, like, the I think the most most visited or most played stage show, like, that, that ever in the history of time because it basically just continuously goes all day long. Um, so it, it, it should never be replaced. That being said, it certainly could stand a little... Um, a little updating in certain scenes. I mean, that the you could do a lot of things with the first scene. You could make the first scene, the, I'm sorry, the last scene. You could make the last scene something, some sort of like permanent, you know, futuristic scene or or permanent, you know, state of of the world at some point. But if you're still purporting to represent the future, I think we could have some fun with that final scene. Leave the other stuff. Don't touch the other stuff. Leave Uncle Orville in the bathtub. Leave the mystery ghost daughter like doing the the wheel washing the, the clothes in the first scene but the the last scene i think definitely like they could be having a lot more fun with and updating and like you know watching grandma play a very you know very sort of low quality vr doesn't feel quite as futuristic <laughs> as it probably once did so no to replacing and yes to updating classic on classic Mongello lawyerism here you know coming up with two different questions in one and baiting us into saying no you can't touch me yeah get it out of here no it's totally two different questions like lisa was saying i mean no i don't think it should be replaced the entirety i do think it should be updated and i do think you know scenes should should change with it 
I think the thing that I've always struggled with is at what point does that final scene become nostalgic like the other scenes before it? And at what point do we just say, you know what, there's going to be one scene and then the final scene is going to be a hundred years later or, or whatever that long time frame is. So I think that they could be really, really fun with it. I think it should be as outlandish as possible, right? Because it's always been on this all, almost on the cusp, right? Like we do have access to these things when it debuted. We did have access to like maybe a VR headset that was Atari level or whatever, or maybe the oven could, you know, set to 500 degrees and, and burn a turkey or something like that. Those are all very much within our grasp now. So instead of just being on the cusp of the future, can it be more like the Jetsons or, uh, you know, insert Disney future programming here so i will also answer by the statement uh it is not um it is not untouchable and it should never be replaced because i think we we've talked about the problem with the final scene you know according to sort of the last iteration of the story of tomorrowland carousel of progress that building was meant to be a museum for the inhabitants of tomorrowland to go and visit and these were sort of snapshots in time so the 80s was meant to look like the 80s because the problem is if you update it tomorrow, it's already going to be out of date. Uh, I don't know that that is ever going to be a solvable problem if you're going to have physical sets that need to be redesigned and installed and engineered and things like that because as soon as it finally is is open, um, it's already going to be a little bit passe. So there's a little bit of a, a conundrum there, but um, we may see if there's another question about what attractions, if any, are in fact untouchable. So uh, spinning the wheel, Connor Brown, randomly select a number and you go next. 19, please. Hmm. 19. Okay. Tiffin's is the best in-park sit-down dining experience in all of Walt Disney World. I just go to Nomad Lounge. That is not the question, sir. <laughs> so I just go to no man. <laughs> Tiffins is. The, are you in or are you out? Oh Lord Almighty! Um, in park, sit down like an in park table service restaurant. Lisa's excited because she's now able to take time to ask Jeeves about all the Disney in park <laughs> table service restaurants. No, I am. I mean, I'm. This. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm going to say out for the sole reason that while I've never done it, I do have people that I trust who have said it's fantastic and you need to try in Japan, Mr. Mangello, to kumite, right? So, I mean, I think like it's hard to put anything above that even without ever experiencing it solely because it's such a unique experience and I, I have heard so many good things from it. Um, and for me, it's also a struggle because when it is Tiffin's, I do mean it. I, I, I do go to Nomad Lounge and I will probably always prefer to do that just because I like the vibe of that a little bit better. And I know that's not the question or anything like that, but that's always going to be how how I frame it um, in, in that regard. Lisa, are you in or are you out on Tiffin's? I am out. So Tiffin's is a great restaurant, and even but even if we're just comparing it to other sit-down restaurants throughout the parks, Tiffin's is a phenomenal meal. But like I would, this isn't my number one, but I would argue that you can get an equally good meal with better theming, in my personal opinion, at Skipper Canteen. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I mean, Takumite exists, and it's a sit-down <laughs> restaurant in the parks, so... It's not it's not even a fair competition like Takumite is sort of in its own stratosphere. Um, so to compare it to other restaurants isn't quite fair, but it's far and away the best seated meal um, in park in Disney. And I would probably opt for Shiki Sai, even even Shiki Sai, the new um, izakaya in the Japan Pavilion more often than Tiffin's just for personal preference. I'm with you. Um, I, I, and that's why I didn't put Takumi Tei as the best sit down because I knew that that would be my answer. I, I think it's the best overall dining experience anywhere in Walt Disney World. And I would, have, if we were ever to do a show about the best dining experiences of all the Disney parks worldwide, um, Takumi Tei would, would be in that top 
five, top three on that list, most probably. Um, so yeah, so I'm out on it being the best sit down dining experience. Although I think it's exceptional. I think it's a, it's a like the food is very very good in addition to the theming. But I think you're right, Connor. I would I would I'm more of a like casual service than I am a table service kind of guy. So I can sort of graze and pick and move yeah. off other people's plates. Um, so I'm with you that I would, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make that long arduous trek all the way down to Disney's animal kingdom, I also am going to go to nomad lounge. All right, Lisa, back to you. Um, pick your random number. Oh gosh. I am going to go with number 12. Number 12. Uh, we will stay at Disney's Animal Kingdom, where we oh. are noshing over at um, we're noshing over at Nomad Lounge. Lisa, in or out, Expedition Everest should have a fully functioning Yeti animatronic, even if it requires a two-year closure for repairs. I'm out. I mean, I think we're all at peace with it. It's a standing <laughs> joke. It's been broken forever. Like you said, you'd literally have to like take the back wall off of the coaster to fix the Yeti. So you'd be shutting down the ride forever. I mean, let's let's put our attention and energy into to newer things and enjoy Everest for what it is. Now, will this um, two year refurbishment take place uh, before uh, the South American uh, uh, entrance coming to Animal Kingdom or after will be, be in the state of flux where there's only two working attractions in Animal Kingdom. Um, I, of course, have a lot of, of follow-up questions. Um, in the interest of, you know, just being different, I'm going to say I'm in. Give me the Yeti. Let's go. If uh, this is taking place after we get our Indiana Jones and Encanto rides, <laughs> right. and only if that occurs, right. um, if you have some, and that's why I thought when Pandora opened, I'm like everybody's going to be looking this way. So while everybody is looking towards Pandora, we'll just quickly go in and and shut down Everest, and and it didn't happen. Which I mean, maybe I do, means it's. I do think it's this thing of like, how many people are going to come just for that, you know? And, and it's like especially to the people that are maybe they've only been once, you know, 20 years ago and mm. they did actually see it working and they have no idea. I don't know if that's going to bring people back to the park as much as the people that were going to come who want to see the Yeti working again, they were going to come again. It's just a happy kind of accident that they've taken it down and they're, they're redoing it. Everest is also just already a great ride. Like it's yeah. a phenomenal, super fun roller coaster. It's not like the main animatronic of like Tiana's Bayou adventure is broken yeah. down. And so there's something hugely missing from the storyline. It's just, a, it's a great ride. Like my kids already love it. I already love it. I don't know how much more we need to add to it. And like, you know, Yeti technology from back in the day, I don't know how impressive it would be today anyway. So I was like, did each of you, either of you, were you actually there those three weeks that the Yeti was actually working, like fully no. functioning? I never saw it. I remember it in my heart of hearts. I swear I remember it. Um, Connor and it's was three, the, by the way, when it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was a tall three-year-old. Uh, the, the thing is, I, it's one of those things where it's like, do I remember it because I remember it or do I remember it because I watched the travel channel special ad nauseum on loop <laughs> over and over and over again? I don't know. Yeah. Because if you saw it, that arm that came down and swung past you was very, very impressive. Like it, it, it was a it still is. It just doesn't work. A remarkable animatronic figure and added something in a meaningful way to that attraction. But, you know, you don't know what you're missing if you've never experienced it. So I'm I am I am out on this as well. I, I think two years to close an e-ticket attraction in that park, even if and when the other attractions are built in the other sections is is probably too long if it's just going to be to fix that. And while it will be impressive you're right. It, it's not going to necessarily be something that's going to draw new people in. It's just going to enhance that experience. And two years might be too much of a trade off for it. So, um, all right. Who's next? You're not picking Time's any up. numbers, right? I'm not it's picking just, any. Go ahead. Okay. 42. 42. Let's go down the list. Uh, let me see. 42. Okay. Let's talk Disney Cruise Line. Yeah. Of which the two of you I know are huge fans of. 
the Disney Wonder is the best overall ship in the Disney Cruise Line fleet. Are you in or are you out? I'm I'm dream and fantasy level kind of kind of person. I just think it's I like the intimateness of the magic, right? And the wonder. I like how small it is. I really like how small it is when you go to the private islands and private destinations because there's a whole <laughs> lot less people there. That's great. But there's just something about, you know, the dream and the fantasy being a little bit bigger. Uh, uh, the Grand Hall, the atrium being a little bit bigger. Um, I think it's also one of those things where it's very easy to say, oh, well, I like this class and I like that class. And a lot of the times it just comes down to was what was the first one you were on that you got accustomed to, right? As an adult, I went back on the on the dream class. So that's the one that I always kind of strive to get back to. Um, so I am, I am out on... Um, uh, uh, the wonder being number one and in on the dream class ships. Interesting. Lisa. So this is funny because I had a feeling that some form of this question was going to be on the list, but I thought you were going to bait us by saying the wish, even though mm. I know you don't think that. Um, and my answer was going to be, no, it's the wonder. <laughs> So I'm fully in. Um, and it, it goes straight to what Connor was just saying about like, whatever was your first tends to be your yeah. favorite. But but also, I, I think there's some sound reasoning behind it. So my very, very first DCL cruise was the Alaska cruise on the Wonder. So oh, yeah. like, it's just forever burned into my memory as like the most amazing experience ever. And then my second cruise on the Wonder was the New Orleans cruise, which was mm. also incredible. Um, but even like setting aside personal bias, like I love a small ship. I love an intimate ship. I love like the feel of the wonder and like the French quarter lounge mm -hmm. on the wonder might be my favorite place to spend time on any Disney ship. Um, just like the theming of that specific area is so phenomenal. Um, and I could, I could, you know, talk for far more than 30 to 60 seconds about why I love that ship, but those are the main reasons. Um, and then add on the fact that it was my first and a fabulous, fabulous Alaska trip and it's hard to beat. So Connor, let me first start off by saying as, as the guy who's not the tallest man in the room, bigger is not always better young man. Wow. Uh, I mm. am very much in on the Disney wonder being the best overall ship. This beautiful, 25, it is one of the oldest ships from a major cruise line at sea, and she she's only gotten better with age. She's 25 years old, but I, I love everything that you said, right? I love the intimate size. I think the French Quarter Lounge is exceptional. I think Tiana's is probably, other than 1923, the best dining experience on Disney Cruise Line, like Apollo, Enchante, I'm looking at you and I will put Tiana's over that for just overall like vibe and experience. Um, I love the Art Nouveau style of the the Wonder even a little bit better, I think, than I like the Deco style of the Magic, although I like those two in terms of the way they are decorated. Um, I do like the smaller ships, both because of when you go to the islands, um, but also, you know, when the, when the Disney, when the larger ships are full, they feel full. And yeah. I never sort of felt that way on both the magic or the wonder. And because too, like Lisa said, of the itineraries, I think Alaska is far and away the best itinerary on Disney Cruise Line. It just, it's, it's, it's just sort of just in a class by itself. Um, it, it, the wonder is my favorite of the ships and the magic is right behind it. And then I think the dream and the fantasy are, are sort of neck and neck. That's three. I I think, and I think we might all agree on this, but here's hoping that on the 27 new ships we're getting eventually from Disney Cruise Line, we get some smaller level ones because, I mean, I don't see that happening. I think mm -hmm. they're just going to kind of keep the same wish level and size. I hope they do bring newer, smaller ships because I do think it's very, very, very appealing to a lot of people us three included. All right, who gets, uh, who goes next? That would be me. Um, I will go with number 23. Number 23. Jordan. 
I'm sure that's why she selected it. Let's go. Let's go to the movies. Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame is the most underrated animated film in their entire catalog. And I'm speaking specifically about Disney. Don't go touchstone. Don't go. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is the most underrated animated film in their entire catalog. Are you in or are you out? So I'm going to qualify this by my like just having heard this question right the second because I could think about it for an hour and come up with something more clever. But at first that I'm just I'm just going to I'm just going to go ahead and say that I'm in. It's a phenomenal movie. It's not a movie that you see very it doesn't have any presence in the parks. Um, the characters don't really have much presence in the parks. Far and away, Frollo, far and away, the the most evil villain, in my opinion, in any Disney movie. I mean, just so like complicated and dark and like rooted in the church, which makes it that much more complicated and that much more powerful. Um, the characters and the music is beyond like, I think some of the music in Hunchback, I think is some of the best music in any of the Disney movies. Um, so yeah, first, um, yeah, I could think about it more and maybe come up with, with a couple others, like, you know, meet the Robinsons I could throw out there as, as, you know, being on the short list as well and a bunch of others, but yeah, no, I think Hunchback is, is, is a contender for sure. As um, soon as Connor starts, Lisa's going to call the voicemail and append her answer. <laughs> um, I take it you guys have never seen the brave little toaster. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I thought you were going to say the good dinosaur. <laughs> that's number one, clearly. Mars um, needs moms. He's going with Mars needs moms. Mars needs bombs. Um, I think Hunchback is supremely underrated. I, I can't explicitly say it's the most underrated because this is a very personal thing too, right? The thing with Disney animated films is if it's the one that came out when you were, you know, in that five to ten age group you're gonna watch it on repeat i had vhs when you when i was young i don't know about you guys um uh a track whatever it was laser disc those sorts of things um but my things that i would watch time and time again that i i really really loved i think from from my era that are underrated hercules and tarzan which i think it's very very funny that hercules having a presence coming back to Disney Cruise Line in a stage show, which I'm very, very, very excited about. Um, I do think Hunchback, though, is is very, very underrated, and I would like to see it more in the parks, especially. Yeah. There was a Hunchback show at yeah. Disney MGM Studios, mm -hmm. which was amazing, other than the fact that it was an open-air theater and it was a little toasty in the summertime. And summertime now runs from February through November. So it, during the summertime months, it was a little bit of a of a sweat box out there. But um, an incredible stage show. I am I am very much like in on this. And as I was thinking about it, after I sort of asked the question, because you know there was a little bit of bias when I wrote the question because I could have inserted other films in there. Um, I, I agree, not just about the complexity of it. And, and when I talk about complexity, like very mature themes in mm -hmm. this. Like when I say mature, I just don't mean like some of the more obvious, like there's prejudice and hypocrisy and sin. And like, this is not normally what you see in the very family friendly Disney uh, animation. And I think it's also a very like emotionally deep film, right? The, the isolation of Quasimodo, the, Esmeralda and her sort of, you know, fighting for her freedom. And the, I think Judge Claude Frollo, I've said this a million times because I, I mean, is the most complex, the most evil villain, but that inner torment that he goes through, again, very mature themes that are being talked about gives this film too a much darker tone, I think, than almost anything else that I can think of just off the top of my head, um, which is it's, you know, it's in stark and and I think in a good way, stark contrast to a lot of the other much more lighthearted things that we get from the animated films. Plus the Alan Menken score is just remarkable. Um, like Hellfire and God Help the Outcasts are beautiful, beautiful films. And I think the animation is breathtakingly beautiful. I think it is, is incredibly striking. You can watch the film on mute and just watch it for, again, going back to the hand-drawn animation um 
I, I think it, I, I, I don't think it received the recognition that it deserved among the other Disney Renaissance films that I think were, I think was sort of overshadowed by these, you know, the lighter, much more commercial hits. So, and maybe it wasn't marketed appropriately at the, at the time too. So I love Hunchback like a lot in case you can't tell. So we need to do another nation watch party and maybe we'll watch Hunchback. So, all right, let me get off my little uh, Hunchback soapbox and whoever's next, pick your number and go. Uh, 16. 16. This one is uh, it is short and sweet, Connor Brown. Oh. <laughs> the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser will never open again. Are you in or are you out? Uh, this is a double negative, so I have to think through it real quick. <laughs> it will never open again. I'm out. I, I think it'll open again in a very, very different capacity. Obviously, like, a lot of people have said maybe it's just a day experience. Maybe you just, God forbid, walk through the lobby of a hotel, you know, <laughs> something like that. I just, I don't know. I find it so hard to believe that they're not going to use that space for something. They're very good at recycling things at Disney, very good at recycling spaces. There are places that will be abandoned for years and years behind Epcot. Next thing you know, it has so many different festival things going on or, or special event things or, or whatever. I just, I would be so surprised if if months, years from now, we just see bulldozers bulldozing that place before it, quote unquote, reopens in some other form. I like the Dietz is in Beetlejuice. Disney never walks away from equity, but we'll see. Lisa? So <laughs> the Star Cruiser will what, never open again. So the question isn't what I want. It's what I think. <laughs> so I would love to see the space be repurposed somehow. I would have loved while it was open for them to have rethought certain things like maybe they could have given access to the restaurant, for example, to... Um, people who weren't staying there. I think there were there were a lot of options. Um, I, I'm not over. I'm not second guessing decisions that were made. I don't know what happens behind closed doors or a lot of the factors. But you know, there there were a lot of things I think that could have been done while it was still open to make things work a little bit better. But that being said, setting my wishes aside. Um, and setting aside the fact that like Walt used everything, like he would have airlifted it to like, <laughs> he would have airlifted it to like the Magic Kingdom, you know, <laughs> cast member parking lot and used it for storage. Or something. <laughs> he would have, he would have not wasted the space. But it's just, it's hard to think about, you know, any besides like if they could, you know, make the the lobby and the restaurant, you know, be something that's open for business and then use the rest of it for office space or something. I, I would love to see even that happen. But it's hard to imagine beyond that, like what they could even try to do with it because you know the rooms don't have windows. It's yeah. it's they're very they're very very small. They don't have windows. That the way that it was set up was for a very specific purpose that I think is hard to repurpose that and then combining that with the fact that it's sort of located out of the way you know the the actual outer facade of it and sort of where it sits you know it can't really exist within theming it it, it was really only themed once you were sort of inside it behind closed doors um it's hard to, it's hard to think of how they could usefully repurpose it and given like the tax write-off that they took on it I don't see it realistically happening. So while I think Walt would be rolling over and, you know, I wish that they would repurpose it. I'm in on like a realistic prediction that it's sort of closed for good. Probably. Yeah. The problem with all the solutions is that every solution has a problem, right? You can't just open it up because how do you get people there? Right. How yeah. do you, how do you have guests park in cast member? You know, there's nowhere for guests to park. It's not themed like it's not there's like for every sort of solution, there's a hundred and one different problems that it that it brings up that are not very easily solvable. I know money can solve everything. Right? You can fix everything yep. with yep. money. But is, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze for the Star Cruiser? Right. You've already taken sort of, sort of taken the the financial loss on it. You know, do you repurpose it to something else that is not front facing to guests, 
you know, never say never, but I might, again, just because of the reality of what it might take to make this be something that is fiscally responsible, attractive to guests, worth the money, worth it. Yeah, I might be in. I know that I'm very sort of waffling on this, but I might be in. It, it will never open again the way it was, but it might not ever open again, period. And that makes me sad because I think it was an, a really, really well done experience. Inside the box, it was everything else that it took to sort of make that happen. Um, but who knows? Who knows? I would love to see. I would love to have more people be able to experience the storytelling that Disney put into that building. So, okay. Uh, are we having fun yet? You like this? Is this good? This yeah. is really fun. <laughs> I think we need some things that we're more in on. Some good things we're more in on. Let's all come on. <laughs> Listen, you guys, yeah. picking, you guys are picking the numbers here. Right, let's do uh, Let's do one or two more. Go ahead. I don't, I don't remember who is, is next. It's Lisa. It's me. Um, I am going to go with, I'd hate to not use like your early ones because I feel like that was like when you were just getting going. So I'm going to go with number nine. Number nine. Uh, this is a, a relatively timely one, depending on when you're listening in the future. Mickey's not so scary Halloween party is better than Mickey's very merry Christmas party. Are you in or are you out? I am out. Wow. So far out. Wow. Wow. Let me write this down. <laughs> Lisa hates Halloween. Okay. I love Halloween, but there well, is Who just... do you? Wow. There's nice. I love Halloween. I love the Halloween parade. I I love ha the Halloween in the parks, but there but like give me like that crisp weather of like early November into the holidays like you know, it used to be dream lights on the castle, but I'll take the projections. The, the, the parks are so beautiful. You know, it, there's a sort of a sweet spot between like November and early December when it's not quite as mobbed as it usually is. The weather's just breaking. Everything looks beautiful. I love like the treats. I love like collecting cookies and hot apple cider and hot chocolate. Um, it's not even so much about, and, and the, the parade is phenomenal too. Like I I would put, you know, the parade at Mickey's um, Very Merry up against Spoodyoo any day. I, I mean, they're both phenomenal. The Headless Horseman is phenomenal, but so are, you know, the, the toy soldiers. Um, Clearly never, Lisa's never seen the Grave Diggers or the Villains Float. It's fine. Keep going. No, I mean, I, I <laughs> they're both amazing. But for me, all day, it's Very Merry. Like I just the the experience of the parks during the holidays and the weather and the somewhat lower crowd levels from like mid November into early December and just the whole vibe of everything like I'm all in I'm all in for the holidays and also like it it's all personal experience right so like when I was vacationing that was sort of the party that I would usually go to with the kids so my memories of it are very special but still like the holidays at Disney just hold such a special place in my heart. I say this as someone who is going to the not so scary Halloween party next week. I'm out. I'm out. Give me Fairy Mary over not so scary any day of the week. Of course, uh, during the seasonal time that it has been available. Um, I certain things I love about the Halloween party. I love the fireworks. Uh, they think I think they're spectacular. I'm also saying this as someone who sees and hears them every night from my balcony, which can get a little annoying. No, I'm kidding. It's very now awesome. he's just flexing. Now I'm he's kidding. Just flexing. I'm going to post kidding. Connor's address. So you can all go listen to the fireworks at Connor's. There's house. a building. There's an obstructed view. I can't <laughs> see all of it. Um, I love the grave diggers. I think the parade has so many unique aspects to it. Um, but for everything that that Lisa says, I I ditto it uh, when it comes to very merry. It's just a feeling. I feel much more at ease, at peace, uh, uh, happier. Not that I'm not unhappy during uh, not so scary, but um, I just always prefer Christmas over Halloween. Um, it's also nice that. Uh, the treats are somewhat self-contained at a very merry, you know, versus 
not so scary where I have so much chocolate that I bring back and it's not good for anyone involved, <laughs> mainly myself. Um, now here's a, we want to talk about controversy. Um, I do not like Hocus Pocus. I do not like the Sanderson sisters. So I find that stage show just the worst. Uh, so that is something I avoid like the plague when I am there. So it is again, my personal opinions that, that have me um, saying that about. <clears throat> Hold on. C O N O R at <laughs> kingdoms. Please oh, send, send them my way. Just... They eat children. What's to like about the Sanderson <laughs> sisters for crime any sake? I will. Uh, I will only answer this by saying uh, my favorite party is the one that I am at. Like when I'm at the mm. Halloween party, I'm like, oh my God, this is the best party. I love this so much more than Christmas. And then I go to the Christmas party and I'm crying because like literally crying as like the toy soldier. I do it every time. I am. So it, I, it's hard for me to say because I love Halloween so much. I think it's like such a fun holiday. I don't like walking around with bags. Of, like I don't like going to the Halloween party in August when it's 112 degrees out and I can't wear my Ewok costume for a, a multitude of reasons, but and you, you know, you bring home seven bags of slightly melted chocolate, but um, I think the stuff that they do there, they do really, really well, but I do have a probably a more, so I, I'm out because I think the Christmas, the, the very Merry Christmas party, I think I have a more sentimental, emotional reaction to than I do the Halloween party. Hey, you're not going to cut this up as a clip and post it where I say that I don't like Hocus Pocus, right? Oh. And post it on social. You're not going to do that, right? <laughs> let please. Me do, let me mark please, let me please. mark this right here. <laughs> oh, no. Let me make myself. Let me make myself. I really wish just end it right there. All right, let me give you one more. Let me uh, let me pick out one more for you guys. Um, all right. You, you, you said you wanted one that, um, that I think you could both be in on. That I think we we'll, we would all be in on. So whoever gets to go first, and this is timely too. The Hall of Presidents should be removed, rethemed, and made into a Muppet show about American history. Are you in, or are you in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, I'm as as red blooded as. As the next guy, America, USA, go baby, go. But there's nothing more American than the Muppets. I mean, <laughs> yeah. My thing is, let's pick a Muppet to, to play each president. That's, I want to be in on that meeting. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't know that that would fare well either. <laughs> Just the old presidents. I don't want any of the new ones. I don't want, I just like, maybe like Washington through, uh, you know. Who's going to be Millard Millard Fillmore? Fillmore. Who do we have? Who really sort of, is Rizzo more Millard Fillmore than? Got to be Fozzie Bear. Lisa? Yeah, I'm all in. I mean, I think, um, you know, we we don't know anything official, but, you know, the the Muppets and Studios might not be long for this world, um, and they do deserve a prominent place in the parks um, and Hall of Presidents. Yeah, you know, we've talked about this before, Lou. I mean, it used to be like an e-ticket attraction, and that that covered area outside where the market is is was the queue. I mean, there it was a hugely popular attraction, and I think it's awesome that it had its time. But you know, unfortunately, the political state of this country is what it is right now, and so the reality is that every four years, Disney kind of has to deal with, or four to eight years, Disney has to deal with. Um, you know, some delicate subject matter for a portion of its guests. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I, I just, I think that ship is, has maybe sailed. I think the, the divisiveness of it at this point in this country probably doesn't need a place in the parks. And the perfect substitute is a super like, you know, Sam Eagle, like Muppets show where like they get their place in the parks. They've even had like, they, they do the, um, they do the Muppets sometimes like from the windows mm -hmm. above in that area and they, they blend in seamlessly. I think they belong in that area. Like they're perfect in that area. And I think it's the perfect solution to a lot of problems, especially if we get news about 3d over in studios. 
Do you mean great moments in history, but only the American ones? <laughs> <laughs> it's a salute to all attractions, but mostly America. Um, America. Yeah, the Muppets have had a long and storied history in Walt Disney World. Um, actually, if you go back to show 723, I did a show about the Muppets that never were in Walt Disney World. We also did like unrealized attractions. I think we've done a couple of different shows about Muppets and, and you're right. It would just be sort of a, it's a very simple, it's a very easy, it's very fun as magic kingdom might be in sort of the early stages of the next phase of what it is evolving to. All right. I'll give you, we'll end on one more potentially even more controversial than politics, more divisive. This is where it might get ugly. And I hope so. Cause it's podcast gold. This is the last question. Ladies first. I don't know. Let me get a screenshot of Connor's face right now. He looks frightened. If I move the mic down, I think you can hear my heartbeat. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Okay. Lisa's putting her angry face on. I packed your angry eyes. I packed your angry eyes. I embraced. Embraced. Go ahead. Ask your question. Disney's Wilderness Lodge offers the most immersive and peaceful resort experience in Walt Disney World. This is me, right? It is you. So there are two resorts that duel in my mind between who does the holidays best, what has the best theming, the best overall experience, and they are Wilderness Lodge and Animal Kingdom Lodge. So far away. God. (laughs) Um... And the what adjectives did you use? Immersive and peaceful? Correct. Animal Kingdom Lodge all day. Um, I love Wilderness Lodge with all my heart. It's one of my favorite. I love Geyser Point. I love being out on the water over there. I love the way it looks in the holidays. I love like the Pacific Northwest theming. I love everything about Wilderness Lodge. But if you're talking about a beautifully themed, just generally beautiful, peaceful, away from it all resort that has just the most immersive, wonderful theming in the world and some of the best food as an aside on all of property, um, Animal Kingdom Lodge all day. So I'm out on yours with with respect. My humble opinion would be to put Animal Kingdom Lodge ahead of it. Fascinating. As someone who in September of 2022 got the awesome opportunity to go with my family to stay at the Old Faithful Inn, when we were visiting Yellowstone out in the West, um, the Old Faithful Inn, what a lot of Wilderness Lodge is based on, in addition to other great uh, uh, national park lodges throughout America, um, being in the real one, I only gained a greater appreciation of Wilderness Lodge. Wilderness Lodge is one of my absolute favorite resorts. My family just stayed there a couple weeks ago. Um, I love it. Uh, it, it is very, very well uh, uh, immersive for all those themings. Um, peaceful. I don't know if you've been there during the hours of 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. while uh, <laughs> breakfast at Whispering Canyon is going on and people are trying to check out. I would not label it as a peaceful <laughs> lobby in that regard. Um, but what is peaceful, like Lisa said, we do agree on this, is the Animal Kingdom Lodge. And for me in particular, Kadani Village, smaller, more intimate. I think that safari is, is uh, or that savanna, I should say, albeit small, expansive. You can see everything, the fires going out there. They have rocking chairs out there, um, like they do at, at Jumbo House as well. But there's just something so serene there. And when you're walking through the halls, even though you're inside, you feel like you're in Africa outside walking, you know, in the bush on the savannah. Um, So I would say for theming and for uh, um, peacefulness, I would agree with with Lisa. It's Animal Kingdom Lodge. So you're both out. Is that what you're saying? You're both out on Disney. We're both out, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, and speaking of being out, um, it was nice of you to, I hope you enjoy your last appearance on the show. You know, as you start talking about Wilderness Lodge, Connor, I'm like, this is why Connor is my favorite guest ever. And then you ruined it. You blew it. It's number two. It's, 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 it's it's the second one for me. Uh, Listen, I, I, 
I slightly respect. No, I, I understand the the lunacy in in you picking <laughs> disease animal kingdom. No, I do. I, I get it. But for me, uh, Wilder's Law, I am all in uh, on this. I think I, I'm not telling you to stand in front of the check in desk at Whispering Canyon at nine <laughs> ten a.m. and ask for ketchup or whatever it is on a Saturday morning. What I am telling you to do is to go and sit. Go out and walk on the dock during golden hour towards the marina where you can take a boat and watch the sunset or go sit by Geyser Point or in front of Geyser Point and watch the electrical water pageant. Dare I say, dare, dare, you go to the Carrollwood Pacific Room and you just sit in silence or round the corner and sit in front of that fireplace or go to one of the quieter pools. The list goes on and on and on. I, I think it. when I go there, um, I, I do feel like I am somewhere else, um, even though I am in the midst of Walt Disney World. I feel there's a sense of escapism for that resort, which, which leads to the immersion. And I, there are so many places that I find are incredibly peaceful. I think the water features, um, especially if you walk – if you walk early in the morning or late at night on your own, when there's not a lot of people out, there, there's a there's this sense of of calm and quiet and serenity now that Wilderness Lodge gives. Um, I don't do a lot of staycations at at Walt Disney World. I just for whatever reason, but a few years ago I did, and and we only stayed like we did not go to the parks. We just stayed there. I have. A, <laughs> For those of you that know me, I have a very, very tough time relaxing. It was one of the most relaxed I have ever felt on a vacation because of of just how peaceful and serene and immersive that was. So I plant my flag very hard with you, Wilderness Lodge, as being the most immersive and peaceful resort experience on property. Right next to All Star Sports during Cheerleader Week. That oh my, that is yeah. a very that's a very close. <laughs> I have second. I have experienced that, and I don't I wouldn't wish that on my my worst <laughs> enemy. Now let me ask you: Did the s'mores old fashioned at Territory Lounge did that help you relax? Because it helped me relax last week when my family was there as well. <laughs> no, but I will tell you that I think Territory Lounge is one of the best. And I still haven't done the lounge show yet. I will, um, because Becky would literally she would murder me if I didn't if I didn't have her on it. But I think Territory Lounge is not only one of the best lounges, it's it's usually not very crowded, has some of the best yeah. food at any... Oh, yeah. oh, I think Wilderness Lodge in general has some of the best overall food of like of all of the resorts, like if you in totality, I think Wilderness Lodge from casual dining all the way up to fine dining might have some of the best food, period. So, so I, yeah, I would put, so I would put Animal Kingdom's food up against Wilderness Lodge's food any day. I mean, there are no losers here. And I, and I agree with you. Like, I think I can think of certainly two, three, probably three locations at Wilderness Lodge, like specific locations just to be that are top five, maybe top three for me, like in all, like there's Carol Pacific and then there's one particular fireplace whose location I am not going to disclose right now <laughs> um, <laughs> that I think are probably the two most peaceful places in all of Disney world. Um, that being said, like as an overall resort and the fact that you use the word immersive as well. Um, we had a similar vacation recently at animal kingdom lodge where we stayed in a room that was on the Savannah and to sit in the morning and watch the sun come up and the animals roaming and coming out and roaming on the savannah and sort of turning in for the night. Like there's just something so wonderfully peaceful and immersive about sitting on your balcony watching that that can't be topped for me. Even just the the sunset, the overlook lounge right off the lobby. Uh, again, mm -hmm. especially if you go on some of the off times, it's a bit, yeah. it's taking nothing away. Look, Animal Kingdom has a lot going for it, um, due in large part to bread service. So mm -hmm. everything else after that is just it's great mm, gravy. Um, everything after that is gravy. There's no um, there's no wrong answers unless you selected Animal Kingdom Lodge. So that's it. That is our uh, that is our first Disney. Are you in or are you out segment? I want to know from you, our friend who is listening. One, what you think of the segment, and I'll post some of these. Um, uh, 
They're not questions. I'll post some of these statements in the clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. I would love for you to weigh in and tell me if you are in, if you are out and why, and if you'd like me to continue doing this segment in the future. Uh, Lisa and Connor, thank you both very much for being here. Lisa and then Connor, please tell people where they can find you on the internets. Um, you can find me primarily at thecastlerun.com, which is my blog where I document our move to Disney and recreating a life full of magic. Um, you can find my photography work at thousandcircles.com, and I'm on Instagram as the Castle Runner. And you can find me over at vacationkingdoms.com, blog, podcast. We help you plan trips to Walt Disney World, Disney Cruise Line, and also the place down the street that I'm not allowed to mention on this uh, particular podcast that has something that rhymes with Mary Motter. Um, you can find it out more. It also Spider-Man, so you could mention it. Oh, it does have Spider-Man <laughs> and Hulk, but not the ones you're used to. Um, it's uh, Vacation probably Kingdoms. Probably not for long anyway, yeah and at vacation kingdoms across the social medias. <clears throat> I will, uh, I will link to both of those on, um, on the show notes page and on the social share. So people can easily find you, you guys have fun. Do you like this? Do you like this idea? I love this. This was so much fun. I mean, it was, it was tough, like doing it real time live, like in front of people, but <laughs> no, it was, it, this was, no, this was fun. This was like some of the most fun I've had recording. Like not knowing what question was going to come was was pretty cool, actually. I mean, it sounds a, like you got fifty questions left too. So <laughs> right. have us back and on, Mandela. Come on. There's Round a two. there's a few in there that I think will will stir some interesting conversation. Dare I say, debate, um, especially when it comes to a couple of topics. So. Uh, this is this is all whether we do this again is dependent on you our friend who's listening let me know if you enjoyed it and we will uh we will make it happen again i had so many i had questions about so many questions about food snacks movies we didn't even get to disney plus we didn't pick good numbers we didn't pick good numbers like there's a one question i literally had highlighted in a separate color i'm like this is going to be the one oh, this no. is going to be the one that's yeah you picked a couple at the end, but we didn't say numbers. You could have slid it out. Well, now you have to ask. <laughs> <laughs>time for this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge, where I test your Disney knowledge with a bit of trivia, history, or ask you to identify where in Walt Disney World you may have heard a sound, song, or quote. Answer correctly using the online form at www.radio.com, and you'll be entered for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia segment is brought to you by you, the WW Radio Nation. And by becoming part of the Nation family, you help bring every episode, live show, and event to life. And for as little as a dollar per month, not only do you help support the show, but you unlock exclusive rewards like monthly scavenger hunts, group video calls, get access to our private community, and as a Platinum member, fun surprise packages delivered right to your door. Plus, your support helps our Dream Team project, which has raised more than $550,000 to send children with life-threatening illnesses to Walt Disney World through Make-A-Wish. So join us in helping to make the magic happen. Thank you so very much for being such a vital part of the show. I love and appreciate your support, friendship, and help, and I love being able to give back to you each and every month. I want to thank some new members of the Nation family, including David Durflinger, Jennifer Kaisel, Karen St. Pierre, Andy Roan, and Laura Kay. To find out more and to join the Nation family, you can visit www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I asked you to tell me what major celebration was ongoing in Walt Disney World in February 2007, which is when WDW Radio began, offering guests special dreams and surprises. Thanks to all of you who entered, got this one correct, and knew that the answer was the year plus of a million dreams. It was a massive year plus long celebration that began in October 2006 and extended into 2008 not just in Walt Disney World, but in Disneyland as well. And I absolutely love, loved, I didn't win anything, but I loved this promotion because it really was centered around granting these unexpected, magical experiences and surprises to guests. Everything from free fast passes to private meet and greets, dream giveaways, a night in Cinderella Castle, and so much more. 
And I think the coolest role ever created at Disney was the Dream Squad, who were literally cast members who were out doing nothing but making people happy, truly making magic, randomly selecting guests to receive these rewards or prizes or experiences. And it just added such another layer of true magic and surprise and delight moments. I think not just for guests, but for cast members as well. And I think to that point, it had a secondary effect of almost creating not just a greater appreciation of the cast members, but a deeper connection between the guests and the cast members and the parks themselves. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were playing for a WWE keychain, stickers, pin, and a mystery item from my collection, not from the year of a million dreams, and last week's winner, randomly selected, is... Ralph Siegel. So, Ralph, congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. And if you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So this week, I'm going to keep it simple, and we're going to go back in time, because I want you to tell me what was the very first Walt Disney World Resort Hotel to be built outside the Magic Kingdom Resort area? What was the first Walt Disney World Resort Hotel built outside of the Magic Kingdom Resort area? So that's contemporary Polynesian, Fort Wilderness, Grand Floridian, Shades of Green. What was the first new resort built outside that area? You have until Sunday, September 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. This week, again, you're going to play for the keychain, the stickers, the pin, and I already have it selected, a very cool mystery item. So good luck and have fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in to this episode of WW Radio. Before you go, just a few quick things. One, what do you think of the new in or out segment? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll post this question and some of these topics over in the clubhouse where I invite you to come be part of the community and conversation where you can talk not just about the podcast or this week's episode, but anything that Disney, Marvel, or Star Wars universe. And let me know what topics you'd like to see or hear on the show. Your input helps shape the future episodes, and I'd love hearing your suggestions. Don't forget to also join me this and every Wednesday night for WW Radio Live on Facebook and YouTube for an interactive conversation, and you never know where I might be broadcasting live from. Please also connect and chat with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello, primarily on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and I still believe that nothing beats a handshake and a hug, so visit our events page at www.radio.com and on Facebook for upcoming events, meets of the month, our group cruises, including our cruise on the Disney Destiny, which I just announced for February 2026. And we still have one or two spots for some of our upcoming adventures by Disney to Japan, Disneyland and Southern California, and our river cruise on the Seine and visit to Disneyland Paris in September 2025. If you have a question or a comment, you can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WW1, and I might just feature your message on an upcoming show. And if you are thinking about or planning your next Disney vacation, whether it's a dream trip to Walt Disney World, a Disney cruise, or any other destination, my trusted partner, Mouse Fan Travel, will take care of all the details so you can focus on the magic. They have more than 20 years of experience. We have more than 17 years of a relationship together. Their services are completely free to you. More importantly, they treat you like a member of their family. You can visit MouseFanTravel.com for a free, no obligation quote today. And if you like what you hear on the show, and I hope that you do, please take a minute to rate and review the show over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or your platform of choice. It not only helps other people find the show, and I appreciate that very much. And if you know someone who loves Disney as much as you do, send them a link to this episode or the podcast in general. Share it with a friend via text, DM, or on social media. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, I hope that you have a great day and an even better tomorrow. And remember to go out, be kind, and choose the good. I love you and appreciate you. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, it's Mark Baldwin from uh, Orange County, California. Just wanted to call in, uh, actually talking about your D23 show. It was great meeting you and Becky finally in person. Um, I think it had been since 2021 since I was listening to you guys. And since I'm in California, uh, I don't get to come out to any events there at Walt Disney World. So glad to see you guys at D23. Um, a little bit of my thoughts from D23 was that uh, I'm excited for a new Avatar experience in DCA, as well as the expansion of Avengers Campus. Um, I think those two 
think it's going to bring a lot of excitement to the parks in California, so I'm excited about those. Um, one thing about having cars in Magic Kingdom that I thought was interesting was that it doesn't seem too far-fetched uh, right now because Cars is actually in Walt Disney Studios Park, or the new name for it coming to uh, to Disney Disneyland Paris. And, uh, yeah, I wrote that one when I was in Disneyland Paris, and it was kind of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, a large part of the park was used for that, um, that attraction there. But it's kind of a fun uh, little ride there in uh, Disneyland Paris. And then also about the new nighttime parade um, coming to the park. Uh, super excited about that and curious to see what it'll look like. Uh, I remember when Paint the Night Parade was happening in the California parks, and it was so awesome. Um, just the music with that, with Owl City's uh, version from Wreck-It Ralph, uh, When Can I See You Again? Just whenever I hear that song, it just brings a smile to my face. So uh, excited to see what, what new uh, nighttime parade that they, that they show. Um, one last thing is I definitely be excited to to join you for a talk about Avengers Campus. Uh, I remember or you had just mentioned it on the live uh the live stream uh, recently and so yeah, I would love to uh join you on that if if possible. I, I love um you know the California parks and being a former cast member um yeah, I would I would love to talk more about Avengers Campus and and what is uh what it's going to look like and what it's what it came out to look like uh during uh, its opening so thanks for all you do and uh, look forward to hearing more of the show hey lou it's christine morrison from flower town pennsylvania i have not called in in a while but you guys you and kendall just did a podcast on my favorite attraction tower of terror and i have two um, really cool Easter eggs uh, that I didn't hear you guys talk about. So, and they're when you come off the ride. So after you tap for your on-ride picture, um, you come out and there's the front desk. And there's tons of references and memorabilia behind the desk. So when I was there in January, I was looking at everything with my niece and the gentleman, the cast member behind the desk said, oh, would you like to see the binder? So he hands us this binder and the binder is awesome because it highlights each individual item that they have on display and what um, episode of Twilight Zone it is in reference to. I think we spent 20 minutes looking at this binder. So that's really cool. Um, and I know that a lot of those are relatively new um, little uh, items that they put out. The other really awesome thing, as you're about to walk into the gift shop, if you look to the right behind this, like, ficus tree, there is a menu framed on the wall at the doors that go up to the Tip Top Club. And it is a menu that was served that night when the hotel was struck by lightning. So you can see what they were serving for dinner. Some pretty interesting uh, little items on that menu. So those are the two things that I didn't hear you guys talk about that people should really check out. Um, they really add to the awesomeness of that ride. It is my favorite attraction other than Flight of Passage. So. Love the episode. I think I'm going to go back and listen to it again. Everyone, have a wonderful day and make someone smile. Bye-bye.